Like, for example, we've talked about the, the movement of the continents already quite a bit. Uh, I will say, well, the movement of the continents, um, you know, the, this, this goes back 250 million years. Uh, of course, a number of the continents are older than that. Canadian Shield and whatnot is something like 4 billion years old. So are there are some of the continents that are newer and older, uh, but these are kind of the main models that we know of uh, relatively recent relatively recent movements of the continents. Um, well, as you saw, they have different names kind of depending on the time frame that they were locked together, time frame they kind of were pulled apart. <coughs> Continental drift, uh, you know, we did talk about this. Like I said, most of these things we've actually talked a bit about before. Uh, but in a nutshell, you know, when you're looking at a map of the continents, uh, plenty of people throughout Throughout time, the time that we've had these maps together, people have looked at these and said, well, they're kind of like puzzle pieces. Wouldn't, couldn't those be fitting together at some point historically? Um, and there's a number of different uh, types of data that we used. Uh, same type of rock, same age of rock, same chemical composition of rock uh, on areas that are now far distance. Uh, things like uh, well, glacial deposits from when uh, a number of different land forms were closer to the poles. Uh, fossils, right? Fossils of species that, that uh, should have been direct neighbors uh, on continents that are now far apart. Um, it wasn't a drill, really. We developed sonar and we developed that to go over, to go after submarines, basically. Once World War II was done and we still had the technology, uh, when we started to map uh, plate boundaries, we started to map that seafloor spreading that I've talked about before that, that we'll talk about again. <clears throat> I guess like pictures are better examples of, of just about everything. Uh, so we talked about the seafloor spreading, right? We got uh, magma coming up here, right? So this comes across this way. There's, of course, underground, underground underwater mountains, uh, we call them sea mounts. These are often also sometimes the, uh, the cause of a tsunami if these have big landslides because they're underwater that still disturbs water. Uh, this is not technically an earthquake though, but if you have tsunamis come from a number of different reasons. Uh, trench also in this image, again a reminder, trench. So when you have crusts that come together, one's forced down, that little gap where it's being forced down uh, causes a deep trench. Uh, those are usually, if you see on the news, that they've seen a new type of fish or something that are in the deep. I say that because there was a news story today about um, particularly an odd-looking fish. Uh, that's where they find them in these deep sea trenches. Uh, also, using uh, sonar, we're able to see uh, these basically these big mountain chains, right? The seafloor is spreading as it's pushing up. Uh, it's creating the world's largest mountain chain that just happens to be underwater. Uh, and a reminder, this is also how we saw that uh, the magnetic poles reverse through time. Uh, little minute particles of metal uh, create little tiny compasses as that magma uh, goes from liquid to solid. 14 plates, Pacific being the largest. Uh, active and passive uh, continental margin. Well, I already showed you the example of, mar of them coming together, right? When they come together, something happens. Sometimes they make a mountain. Sometimes one is shoved under the other. Sometimes there's volcanoes. But there's something that happens when they're actively kind of coming together, right? Uh, there's plenty of continental margins that are just sitting there. Uh, not doing much besides weathering away, right? And those ones, right, these plate boundaries coming together, so you got some volcanoes, some mountains, a lot of volcanoes in uh, Alaska. People don't kind of kind of <coughs> connect Alaska with that kind of thing. Uh, now on the other side of our continent here, you can see there's no active thing going on, right? This is just basically eroding. Uh, and so you have a kind of a very gentle slope here when you go under underwater, as opposed to more of the sharp, you know, when you have them being pressed against each other. And you can kind of see in this image that the Pacific Plate is the biggest, although they've, they've divided it up on this map. <clears throat> um, our first evidence of where these different 
plate boundaries were. It came about through earthquakes and, and natural disasters and things that could be uh, pretty easily mapped. Uh, then we started to seeing uh, a lot of correlations with a lot of patterns especially in you know, what we call the Ring of Fire, which is the whole Pacific area, including Alaska. Um, how do plates move? Well, as I mentioned, those come together and can push up. Uh, mantle, drag, slab pull. Well, like I said, pictures are always better examples of this. So a slab pull, uh, they use the metaphor of if you have like a heavy chain that's over a fence, if more of the chain is over one side of the fence, uh, it'll just kind of pull it down, even though the other side is very heavy. If you have the other side of the chain is heavier and it's pulling down, that's a big part of why this is being pulled because of actually the weight of all this kind of going down. Um, talked about this process, uh, mantle drag, that just kind of the in-between aspect of these two. Uh, how fast do they move? Um, you know, that's why we call it geologic, geologic time, uh, is because it's very, very, even the fastest, right? Even the fastest is moving at a rate that is barely perceptible by humans. Uh, our machines and our equipment can tell. Uh, speed uh, of the different plates. We've talked before about how uh, India itself is moving uh, one of the fastest, right? And that's why this mountain range is so big. Uh, let's see, as you can see, Australia is actually moving quite fast. Uh, you know, when I say fast, this is all things being relative. Uh, it's fast as far as um, GPS equipment and whatnot. As long as it, uh, they're updated with satellite imagery and whatnot, then we could kind of uh, update these, but it does become an uh, issue uh, for people who live in Australia because their little GPS will start to be slightly off sometimes. Uh, they'll have to do, do a reset. Uh, plate tectonics. Oh man, this huge list of stuff. All right, plate boundary landforms, right? What are the things that happen at where these plate <coughs> boundaries come together? It kind of depends on which of these things it's doing. Um, right, we have mountain chains where we have the ridge separating off, um, subduction zones very often cause volcanoes and also deep sea trenches, so that's kind of how we recognize that. Um, and then you could have these transform boundaries, uh, San Andreas Fault being a big example of that, uh, where they go side by side in their evidence, uh, well, is, is usually, uh, man-made landforms that, that are get disrupted in that process. That's how we see, see how that's happened. Uh, divergent plate boundaries. This is where the youngest rock is kind of being born, right? Um, the seafloor spreading, right? This is, this is the very youngest rock. Um, volcanoes, of course, are, are churning out uh, younger rock as well, but that tends to be more more of an explosive process. This is more of a continuous uh, make a new rock progress process. Uh, rifting, right? Rifting is, is when uh, you have an area that's being tore apart, basically, right? Uh, the kind of classic big example, uh, the Rift Valley in Africa here. Basically, well, it sounds like, it is what it sounds like, right? You have the land pulling apart uh, eventually there will be a new ocean in the center of Africa uh, in many millions of years. Right now there's some big lakes, right? It looks a bit like this, the Rift Valley as the land is pulling apart. Uh, this is a part obviously that isn't, hasn't become a lake yet. Um, subduction, subduction zones. Um, subduction zones, again, is where that crust is being forced under. Uh, and we have equipment that can look at different earthquakes that happen uh, in different places and at different depths. Uh, this helps in, of course, earthquake prediction to kind of know uh, what type of earthquakes and what their origination points are, uh, but also tells us the thickness of the crust of the rock, how molten it is or isn't, the layers of, of the crust. 
recycling of the ocean the lithosphere. Well, when we say recycling, <clears throat> there's a good picture. There's not a good picture, what? Recycling is basically, well, we, we know in the, the mid-ocean ranges, right, it's creating new rock and that's going up. Uh, and that rock usually doesn't see the light of day, right? The oceanographic, because again, remember, this is the heavier, heavier rock in our continental crust, relatively lighter. This is floating on top. Uh, but the weight of this, when they collide, the heavier one goes under. Um, and it's, it's recycled in that, uh, well, you do have lots of things going on that deposited uh, carbon, for example, in this layer. Um, wind and weathering and erosion that happens everywhere. Every time a drop of rain hits something, it erodes some amount of material. Uh, and that ends up at the, at the bottoms of the oceans very often. And so in that process, a lot of carbon has been captured and stored through time because uh, it's brought down deep into the earth to, to be gone for millions of years. All right, let me back up and see if there's any uh, important concepts I skipped when I was looking for an image. Um, yeah, like I said, the the well, the oldest shield. We have a number of different places that are uh, continental shields. These tend to be kind of like the continental areas that are kind of the hardiest. Uh, well, and as you can see, they've lasted quite a bit of time. Um, that's usually a, a product of the composition of the underlying rock and kind of how rigorous that is to weathering <coughs> and erosion. Uh, flux melting. Well, when I talk about uh, that subduction zone and the, the crust being kind of forced under, um, you know, it's, it starts to heat up starts to melt. Sometimes that melting can be forced into a, a volcano. Sometimes it's not quite hot enough to cause that and it just kind of can create mountains and whatnot, but not necessarily full, full volcanoes. Um, we also have, lots of times when you see these volcanoes, they're, they're in straight lines. Uh, and that's because the crust is moving, but you could have actually the one uh, hot spot uh, that's putting out magma will be in the same spot as the crust is going over it. So that kind of creates a line of volcanoes. Um, sometimes, well, when they're not a hot spot volcano, uh, the volcanoes will be just along the whole boundary of where the plates are coming together. Uh, that's what we call continental arcs. A uh, good example is uh, actually, well, in the U.S. over by Washington State. Uh, and then this actually continues on up into Alaska, where we have the same thing going on where the continental crust is forced under, and it starts to melt as it goes under. It's heated up. Uh, amounts are forced up. Same phenomena, uh, but you can just kind of see through time. Uh, well, the process of this moving, creating a, a line of volcanoes. Uh, like I said, this part here extends all the way up in Alaska. It goes over, in, included in Japan, large parts of Asia. Um, again, this is just the, the ring of fire, as they call it. Uh, collision, uh, as it sounds like, that's when two plates are coming together and they they smash together, uh, usually creating mountains. Uh, these are non-volcanic, non-volcanic, because uh, they're, they're pushed up from tectonic forces, uh, but those forces aren't, uh, well, the collision isn't hot enough for that much warmth, right? Uh, at least not usually through time. Sometimes uh, it can speed up and slow down sometimes as well uh, and kind of switch gears. Uh, but there's plenty of these types of boundaries where they're just mountain chains, like the Rocky Mountains, aren't particularly volcanic. Uh, Tibetan Plateau, not particularly volcanic. Plenty of mountains aren't volcanic, they're just still a product of continents coming together and pushing up land. The biggest example, well we've talked about India a number of times, but India pushing up the Tibetan Plateau. Um, let's see. Let's 
good example of corded terraces. Actually, this is a good example. Let's do a, a little zoomed up version. Um, you know, I talk about sea mounts, uh, which are uh, under, under, well under mountain uh, chains, but uh, you know, you could have ones that are big enough that they peak above uh, land. Uh, these ones are volcanic in origin, so if you could picture like the Hawaiian Islands, right? So the Hawaiian Islands being on continental crust, right, that is being pulled in, uh, well, those will be pulled in and eventually they can kind of merge with this mountain. Uh, and that happens quite a bit in different mountain chains where you have uh, different, different uh, landforms that were under the ocean that have been kind of pulled in and then more times goes by you have more landforms that kind of emerge and then those are also pulled in this kind of constant process it's kind of like scraping the top off of uh, the oceanic crust layer that's going in so that's why you know when they, they look at these mountains because these mountains will usually continue to be pushed up and so then you'll have marine sediments and whatnot that are at the tops of mountains Uh, transform plate boundaries. These are the ones that are going side by side, right? Uh, and they're still of note because they, they create earthquakes and uh, environmental damage and destruction, uh, but they don't create things like volcanoes. They don't create things like mountains too much, uh, maybe hills, uh, but not a lot of mountains when they're going side by side. Hotspot, uh, talked about those a bit already. Again, that's when you got like one part of, of magma going and the, the crust is pulled. Um, let's see, hotspot tracks. We got good images of this kind of thing. Again, the Hawaiian Islands are, are kind of the classic example uh, that people use because you have an island chain, right? And you have the older ones that are further down and the newer ones uh, and the older ones once they're not building anymore, they just start to erode, uh, eventually often forming islands that are, the only remnants are the uh, coral, right, that used to surround it. So through time as the hotspot itself moves, because the, the crust is being dragged, the, you could have past volcanoes be wore down, could be completely submerged. Uh, many islands in the Pacific are basically just old volcanoes that have been uh, wore down through time. Uh, hotspot tracks, lots of different little hotspots of volcanoes that are here and there, and they all leave their little uh, a little chain of islands uh, behind them. Sometimes these islands can be mostly underwater, but you know, with sonar, we could still see them and see where they came from. Uh, Yellowstone, very big moving hot spot. People been to Yellowstone? People been to Yellowstone? Old people? Uh, I would say if you get a chance, uh, you know, this summer, go on a trip, go visit Yellowstone. Uh, you'll be you'll be shocked by how much kind of geologic and tectonic activity there are. There's all kinds of these uh, hot lakes uh, that have all kinds of different chemicals. Uh, there's also you know, you'll have all kinds of wildlife here walking around while you kind of visit these different things. Uh, geysers, uh, there's actually just a, a ton of these and usually usually they create these great big uh, structures that are that are very pretty, these these white residue of, of, of all the, the material that's being injected up. Um, if you get a chance to go to Yellowstone. Uh, but that also has a hot spot that is slowly moving underneath, uh, in fact, well, I was going to say, maybe it's headed toward Minnesota, but it looks like it'll actually would go over us uh, if we had the millions of years to, to wait for it. Folding and faulting. Uh, well, Earth's crust, uh, I mean, under stress, uh, it'll crack at it. It'll, it'll smash, uh, and it's put under stress all the time. Um, you could have areas where it's been uh, under stress and folding, and so the actual old uh, layers that we kind of take for granted, granted when we dig down and layers are, are older through time, well, if this can be pushed and kind of scooped around and uh, it could be recumbent and kind of folded back on itself. 
Um, this process also creates a lots of uh, uneven ground, right? Because it's smushing together. It's like crumpling up a piece of paper, right? It's like there are areas that will be higher and there are areas that will be lower. Um, if that process continues, as I said, it could be completely fold over, inverted topography. Um, I would say you could see this type of thing uh, if you're ever on a long road trip and you're going through like maybe Montana, California or Arizona or someplace where they blasted through the rock to put a put a road. Um, very often when you're driving through, you can just like see past ages of, of uh, geologic time while you're driving. Lock landforms. Um, well, Grand, Grand Tetons over in Wyoming is an example of this. Uh, if you have land that's kind of pulling apart a bit, right, you'll have parts that will settle in. Uh, and as long as that's still above the water table, uh, it'll, it'll be land, but it will create, uh, well, a mountain range that looks a lot bigger if you're on one side of it than if you're on the other, right? Because you have the whole land that's kind of sunken down. Go on the, the impressive side for the good photos. Um, aerial genesis, that's basically just the process of, of making mountains, right? Um, again, these are usually, usually the process of crust folding, crust coming together, some type of tectonic uplift that is more than the weathering. Um, Tibetan Plateau, we talked about the Tibetan Plateau quite a bit. Um, want to go to some good images um, so climate change and whatnot I've talked about how uh, there's seasonal melt up here right that you have glaciers but you have glaciers that uh, basically stay the same size and there's seasonal snows right just like seasonal snows happen here uh, well and we're getting seasonal flooding because those those seasonal snows uh, uh, I also teach over at uh, University of St. Thomas. Uh, and there, the geologists there were doing lots of studies about the probability of flooding this spring. Uh, and they kept on telling me on and on, they're like, oh, there's gonna be all this flooding, there's gonna be all this flooding. I felt that the snow was melting at a rate that maybe it wouldn't be that bad. Uh, but there is, but there is. Which is, you know, uh, there's plenty of areas of the world where that flooding happens annually. Uh, and it's part of the natural cycle uh, feeds off into big rivers that are big rivers that are big enough that they support entire civilizations. Um, in fact, there's 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 an ancient civilization in this in this valley civilization that when this moved uh, about five thousand years ago, and rivers move a lot. We have a chapter on rivers that we'll talk about that more. Uh, but when that river moved, that entire civilization just like collapsed. Uh, and all, all the art, all the cities, everything was just abandoned because there's no water anymore. Um, Ganges, right? This is, this is a water system that feeds a billion people, right? Um, well, all of these, as you can see, they're based on, well, you have seasonal melt, right? Seasonal melt. Uh, and these have all been, the seasonal melt years have been surging, have been more than they ever have been because there's more melt happening. Uh, like I mentioned before, that there are some random glaciers in this area that are growing because uh, the air has enough moisture for their, well, the air is warm enough that it can have moisture, right? We experience this in Minnesota in the middle of winter where there's, it's just so cold, the air can't even have enough moisture to snow. Well, I guess we didn't experience that much this year. Uh, it was always warm enough to snow this year. Well, as I was saying, when this melt-off happens, uh, and if it, it, when these glaciers eventually are, are even more gone, uh, well, then we have a, a large percentage of the world's total population. Because uh, right in this area here, we have like three, four billion people, right? Uh, just to give you, a, give you an example of populations here, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, this country here, it's like half the size of Minnesota. Like half the size of Minnesota. 
could picture, picture half of Minnesota. You've probably driven around enough, you could kind of picture half of Minnesota. It's five million people in Minnesota. Five million people. Bangladesh, half the size of Minnesota, has 165 million people. 165 million people, half the size of the US, and the size of half of Minnesota, right? A lot of people, a lot of people, population density. Uh, it's tough to, to describe unless you've been, uh, although I've only been over, over here. I didn't get to the, I didn't actually get to this side. I only had time for this. Uh, that's basically, uh, the end of this chapter talks about uh, also lots of lots of dams and mega projects. Uh, I would say actually we talk a lot more about this. We have a whole chapter on rivers coming up, uh, and so I don't know why they didn't decide to use this in that chapter of rivers, but hey. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, in the region, um, well, there's been a pivot to try to find alternative sources of energy. Sources that are uh, not as polluting, don't create as much carbon. Places like China, uh, you know, the distribution of the Earth's resources is, is kind of random. Um, not unlike, you know, drawing cards from a random deck. Uh, places have different qualities of these. Well, China was fortunate in that it has a lot of coal. Uh, which is a great source of energy, uh, but it's coal has a lot of impurities in it, right? Coal, uh, like any type of rock, uh, usually has whatever was around at the time kind of mixed in it. And so when you mine it and whatnot, when you're burning coal, um, if it has other stuff in it, you know, it's a costly process to try to separate out pollutants. So instead, what normally we do is we just burn the whole thing. The US, we actually have, our coal is, is quite a bit cleaner, uh, but we still have uh, scrubbers uh, to try to clean it when it's burned for energy, because there's still a lot, of, a lot of coal energy in the US is burned. Uh, in China, they rely on it even more so. Um, in Europe, they've mostly switched to alternative fuel sources. Like France uses something like 70% of its power comes from nuclear power. Uh, a lot of Europe does that, huge percentage of nuclear. Because again, it doesn't, doesn't uh, emit carbon. Of course, it has its own problems and its own things that it emits, but it's not putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Well, rivers, uh, energy from hydroelectric power, that's also just like uh, a resource that doesn't produce carbon. Uh, so as you can see here, there's all kinds of mega projects that have gone on because they really tried to, uh, you know, all along falling water, all along this pattern, it's falling, right? So you have a great big top of a mountain all the way to sea level. And they try to, every single little bit that they can get energy out, right, they do. Uh, <clears throat> well, the, this is a, a, a lot of kind of stress on your environment in its own way. Um, a number of these projects, uh, they, well, they, they built this big mega dam uh, biggest dam in the world, uh, but it caused earthquakes because it's so big uh, and how much water that it's changed. Because when you put these in, right, the water's coming down here, you put in a dam, you, you, you have a huge reservoir behind it, right, of water that fills up, and that has weight on the landscape that wasn't there before, right, and so your landscapes adjust. The other thing with these, they create these big reservoirs, Typically, along rivers, there are people living there. So for each of these dams, when they put them in, they actually have to displace a whole bunch of people. Often millions of people have to find new homes. Uh, and then the trade-off is, well, you're getting more power, so cheaper electricity, less pollutants. Um, coal is so plentiful that people use it there like, uh, I don't know, you see wood for sale at like the gas station and stuff, because you, you, know, you want to make a little outdoor fire. They have coal like that. They have people who come around in a little little uh, trailer. Sometimes it's on the back of a bike. They have these round coal things that you buy and you use it for cooking. People use it for cooking. You use it for heating like your own coal. Uh, something that the US and Europe haven't, haven't used coal like that for like 100 years. 
Uh, but China is still doing it, partially because there's so much, so it's cheap source of energy. Uh, pros and cons of mega projects. I talked about a bunch of these. Um, anything else? Well, I guess I didn't mention international conflict. Um, there hasn't been a ton of that in these specific cases. Maybe we will get into this more in our chapter on, on rivers, because I would say rivers and dams, usually there are lots of political repercussions, because they'll be, you'll have a major river that goes through many different countries. Well, I'll show you specifically the Nile uh, from when I went there and, and the kind of conflicts over water. Um, perhaps it's because, well, in dry regions, maybe they just have more conflict about water because of its scarcity. Maybe that's, plus this is, this is all inside of China. And although these are areas that have different ethnicities and different languages and different, all kinds of different things, uh, they're all part of one country. So you don't have not a lot of political strife about the decision process. Oh, that's it? All right. Well, wow. oh man, so much time. Can I have you guys do some questions? But I'm gonna come out and do the cards thing so that maybe you'll meet new people, new ideas and new perspectives. Or maybe not, we'll see. It all depends on the, the luck of a draw. But I'm happy to do some questions at the end of the chapter. I think it's questions three, four, and five. But I'll double check as soon as I've done. All right, that's all I got to have. Um, all right, who has aces? Who has aces? Aces, aces? Just one person has an ace? No way. All right, let's, let's hold off on aces for now. Who has hearts? Who has hearts? Do you have a cluster of hearts anywhere? Not really. All right, how about hearts over there, because there's some empty seats. Hearts over there. Who has spades? Spades. Spades. Spades? All right, how about spades in the back corner? How about clubs? Who has clubs? Clubs? All right, looks like that could be a cluster here of clubs. Uh, back again, aces, right? Who has aces? Does anyone have aces? You have aces? No, you got a... Uh, uh, spade. Maybe I didn't hand out any aces. Uh, Alright, well, diamonds? Who has diamonds? What did I say? Aces? What am I saying? Yeah. Okay. Diamonds. Uh, well, I already had a group go up here. How about back there? Um, and since you're in the diamond group, you got to go uh, work. You do the, like, the first question of your group. Alright, go to, go to those spots. Let's see how that works out. If I didn't goof it up, I need to do a different training. Thank <laughs> you.